Hi guys, we're back again, and although there's no Bok game to look forward Craig to... Craig Lewis! <laughs> Craig Lewis, don't waffle. The people have come here to see one thing and one thing only. What's that? Did you not call the Springboks to beat Argentina in Mendoza last week? Yes or no? It's a yes or no question answer. Affirmative. Did I not call Argentina to beat the Springboks in Mendoza last weekend? I think you did. And after that particular deal, you said to me, well, how much money do you want to put on it? And off camera, you were like, oh, I thought you were going to say 10 rand or 20 rand. But I actually said 100 rand. The people have come here to watch you give me 100 rand. Now that's when my memory gets a bit fuzzy. <laughs> I can't actually recall that. Is that what happened? <laughs> um, we, can re we can rewind that. In fact, we'll just cue that right now and we'll rewind it to that point. Um, you willing to put how much money on it? 100 rand. And I'll hand it over to you. Let's do it. <laughs> and back live now with you giving me 100 rand. No, no in, in all honesty, I've come bearing the money. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I have to congratulate you. That was a, a good call. And I was already thinking before kickoff how I was going to spend my money, maybe on the blade fade. And it's, <laughs> it's, all, uh, it's all backfired. So. I must say that I'm going to give you an opportunity to win your money back, as a gentleman should. Give your money back a little bit later in this tournament. But for now, <laughs> I might spend this in Bree Street on, at, uh, at Clark's a little bit later on the fried chicken sandwich. It's going to look incredible. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you for this. Thank you for honoring our agreement. But you were saying? Yeah, I think uh, moving beyond your, your winnings there, um, Box have dropped now to seventh in the, in the world rankings. And it just got me thinking a little bit about like why so many people predicted Box to win in Mendoza and why it's such a huge shock and end of days when, when they actually uh, failed to, to you know, get a win in, in Argentina where they've struggled before. And maybe we just need a little bit of a reality check and a, and a perspective realignment in terms of going, the Box are seventh. They've regressed a lot over the last few years and, and they're now a mid-tier team. So why do our expectations not match that? We shouldn't be expected and, and, and hopeful of the box to beat the All Blacks. There's something like 12 um, or so ranking points between the All Blacks and the box. That's how yeah. much the gulf has become. In the same regard, why should we be expecting to go and beat the Wallabies away from home? They are higher in the rankings than us. They are a better team than us. We are a, a side in transition at the moment. So let's respect that process. But do we as a public have the patience and the, the perspective to, to, you know, to allow that process to unfold naturally? Right. The answer is no. I mean, by virtue of the fact that we're having this conversation. Um, so so just, just to start off quickly on that, on that game in Argentina, that was part of what kind of established my pre the premise of my prediction was that, I, and I said it, we, well, we discussed this last week, that this is a team in transition. From what I'd seen in previous tests, I felt like a team at this phase of the development wasn't going to beat Argentina in Mendoza. But more broadly speaking, is the issue at hand, the one that you raise, and the one that's so valid. No, we don't have a realistic expectation of the Springboks because, because traditionally um, the Springboks have been a superpower in the global game. And, and it's, not, it's, not unique to, it's not unique to the Springboks. This is, a, this is kind of a cross-code phenomenon. Um, so I use, for example, um, if you, like I'm, I watch a lot of NFL, the Giants, for instance, so the Cowboys are even a, a, a better example. The Allen's Cowboys were... Um, you know, enjoyed a dynasty at some at some stage um, in their lifespan, and um, and still today, people speak about the Cowboys in terms where they are um, legitimate challenges to the Patriots, for example, or the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, in basketball terms, the Chicago Bulls um, suffer from the same kind of. Um, there's a disparity between the actual capacity and capabilities of the team and the expectations of the team. So it's not unique and there are many more examples like that. It's not unique to the Springboks. Um, and, and off camera, you and I spoke about the, the disparity between the expectation and what's realistic. Um, and um, and we, really, we really have to, as a South African rugby public, get a reality check. Like, we, like there's a reason that, we, that the All Blacks gave us 57 in Albany last year. There's a reason. If you, you brought up the, the example of in the test cricket rankings, for example, you would never expect seven to beat one um, in a test match. You never ever. The bets are off. 
Yeah, it's an anomaly. But right, yeah, <laughs> right. Completely. And, um, and, but yet, as a South African rugby public, there's that expectation because of historic dominance and, um, and that level of competitiveness. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I recently chatted to um, Swayze Brain, who's now working as a, um, a consultant to the box. And he said, you know, he's been with the Lions, obviously, over their period of transition going, um, you know, from relegation to the, the leading uh, Super Rugby team in South Africa. And he said, you can't expect, the Lions didn't expect to become a, a top team overnight. It was a process of two, three years. Um, and that had to unfold. They had to build the players, they had to work with the guys. But because they'd started without any great expectation on them, they had the opportunity and the time to let that team evolve and, and become that brotherhood we see now. Yeah. The box don't have you know, the freedom to do that. They're not afforded it. Yeah. And that's the problem. They need a similar amount of time. And we shouldn't be thinking about next year's World Cup, really, should we? Because there's no, there's no way they can go from seven to one in, in 12 months or whatever it may be right now. So do we as a public uh, have the capacity to go, they need a longer period of transition under Rusty, who's got a six year contract. Let's think beyond that into the next World Cup. Let's give them the freedom to evolve. And if we lose, to Argentina away from home, it's not the end of the world and we don't need to be calling for Rassi to be fired, yet we are. Right, um, and how dare you Craig, how dare you ask for patience in a South African, in a Springbok rugby context. It's, it's, I mean that's, f for the majority of Springbok fans, it's un unthinkable that we won't compete with the All Blacks this year, um, that the Wallabies might beat us home and away, um, and that, um, that we might struggle on a year in tour that is uh, that entails tests against uh, France, Wales, but uh, but on a year in tour like that, like I can see you, this this particular Springbok team um, losing two from three, for example, yeah. and um, and that shouldn't surprise us because the majority of the sides are ahead of us in the in the rankings. But to the point that you're making, like what does that period of patience then look like? Right. So it's it's one thing going have patience with this team. And I do think that the team is worth the investment from a patient's perspective. I do think this team and this coach is worth that. But then I want to see a purposeful plan set in place and, and, and whatever that looks like, whether it's the implementation of director of rugby, which we can flesh out a little bit more, um, an intense focus on our junior provincial um, structures um, and, um, and, the, and player retention in this country. And on the converse side, what are we doing to ensure that our best players that are based abroad are available for, for, for our test matches more? Because now there's an issue with Vali Leroux again. Um, Rassi is pleading with Dwayne to come back to play um, again. And these are things that we need like, like clarity on and a concrete plan um, that is set in place that says, okay, you know, maybe, maybe this is going to take three years, maybe it's going to take four years. Um, and over the course of that time, you'll see significant progress yeah. to where reality and expectation um, come closer to each other. Yeah, because I think Russi's acknowledged we are um, seventh or we were sixth before the, the defeat uh, last weekend. So we've got to go step by step to getting back to number one. So however long that may take, how are we going to go along that pathway to, to get back to where we once were? Yeah. And we have to look at the, the problems which may be player drain, uh, a lack of uh, intellectual property with the, the coaches that have gone abroad, yeah. uh, maybe succession planning being a problem. Uh, is there uh, contracting issues with the player pool maybe too big in terms of the junior structures throughout the country? All that stuff I think falls probably into the the basket of director of rugby and his and his workload. But we've got Rusty obviously juggling uh, his head coaching role and that's his first priority. But he's also director of, of rugby in South Africa. Is he able uh, you know, to have the time to really focus on the other things that will enable the box um, to get back to where they should be? And I just, I don't know if he's, he's got enough time to do that. And that's why I wonder whether there shouldn't be a view towards allowing him to focus more on that role and getting another head coach who comes in maybe beyond the next World Cup. Yeah, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. The other one is to get a, a dedicated director of rugby um, and, um, and then install Rassi as, as the head coach. Although I think he's, just from a from purely personal like vision perspective, Rassi would prefer um, the role as director of rugby. He's got oversight of a broad range of issues within the South African game. But the one issue that we, that we didn't bring up yet and, 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 and is, I think, key um, from a structural perspective, so to get our structures right, 
is then to, to, to send the task team to New Zealand to, to understand um, how, they, how they structure their rugby from junior level all the way through to professional level. And that's, that's been like, a, how do you do, how dare you do that? But in a professional era, if the blueprint is there, um, then how, how, do you not, how do you not look to the blueprint um, for guidance and for clarity? And sure, you put your own spin on things. And sure, we've got our own um, unique set of challenges in the South African context. But the blueprint is there. And, um, and so we're not asking this, the All Blacks to, um, to gift us the great tactical and technical secrets. We're not, we're not asking that. But they've, they've a structural blueprint for how professional rugby union should function. Sure. Um, and key to that is the central contracting system, obviously, which has been a big talking point here. And I mean, I don't know if it would ev ever happen, but we are taking steps towards that, I think. But that's a critical area as well. But we can't, we can't now keep going. Um, you know, you expect the, 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 the spring box to succeed week in and week out. When the reality is completely different, there's a structural mess below them, um, and and all of those things need refinement um, en route to this kind of promised land that 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 may may be there. Yeah, and I think I'll just close with one one other thought. You know, um, Rusty mentioned straight after that Mendoza game that he wasn't sure whether the, the plan now needed to change. He obviously wanted to make a few changes for the next test against the Wallabies. And he said he had to go back and look at the plan, or was the plan the problem, or was the execution the problem? And I just hope he doesn't now go and change what he had um, in mind going forward. He, you know, I hope it's not just one result that he sees the public uh, backlash and suddenly thinks he maybe shouldn't go ahead with the plans that he had, he'd laid out probably weeks before. I hope he can back uh, the players and, and the plan that was in place and just um, you know, take a step back and, and, and allow that um, process to unfold the way he'd hoped it would, even though there's a hiccup along the way. Sometimes it happens. Yeah, so, so my thinking around that is that there's two kind of um, conflicting things at play here. To negotiate a six-year contract, you, Rassi would have had to have sold them on a longer term vision, right? And, um, and uh, yet, it sounds like he's feeling the pressure of the South African rugby public. Those two don't live well together. Um, and, um, and I've said for a long time that, that ultimately, and I mean, speaking to Heineke Meyer following his, um, it, was, it was in the days after he got, he, he got fired. Um, and, um, and you know, we were ex exchanging texts and, and he said, you know, at this point, my one regret is that I didn't do it on my terms. I didn't, I didn't follow what my gut instinct was. Um, I succumbed to the pressure of being the Springbok coach. Yeah. I hope that doesn't happen with Rassi. Um, because, I mean, for me, he strikes me as a, as a visionary. Um, and not only a visionary, but, but the man with the practical kind of um, know-how to implement the vision at the, at the micro level. And, um, and that's what he was speaking to in that press conference afterwards. And it's such a critical point that you raise. I hope that Rassi... Um, follows his instinct and his convictions that he doesn't succumb to the pressure of the um, and and as a journalist I've been I've, I mean I can't speak for you but I've been um, in the past guilty of it of heaping pressure early in somebody's reign um, and um, and then continuing with that through but you know we live and learn and and as you become more emotionally intelligent you understand that rugby is a lot like life um, there's there's some aspects of life that play out over a period of time and, um, and need to play out over a period of time and you need to you know put those, those little chess pieces in place before you can actually get to the check, checkmate stage of the, of the game so to speak to use a chess, a chess analogy um, and, um, and that's really where, where he's at now so again we come back to there's a difference between a coach that I feel is technically competent that is worthy of our investment versus one and again, I'm, I'm back to Alistair Kutsia, who I don't think um, was that guy. So he wasn't worth our investment, in my view. But Rassi is. Uh, and I just hope he sticks by his, his conviction and his plan and that yeah. he doesn't succumb to that pressure, man. Well, sure, yeah. And we'll probably see a bit more of that next week, whether he sticks to it or, or reverts to something else. But anyway, for now, enjoy the money. Maybe I'll need you to buy me some lunch. <laughs>